Recently, I was on a podcast where I was asked to talk about, you know, the reptile hobby and reptiles in general. And one of the questions that they had listed for me was, were there any reptiles that I would like to see removed from the hobby? And I did have an answer for them really quick, which honestly startled me. This wasn't one that they gave me beforehand for me to think over. They had just read it off a list at me and I, scarily enough, had an answer right away. And that got me thinking, are there reptiles that I wanna see out of the hobby? And honestly, I don't really wanna see any out of the hobby. I would just love it if there were a few species of reptiles that are very popular in the hobby right now that I just wish weren't. That they don't necessarily make the best pets for a lot of people. They're not cared for often responsibly or properly. And it just doesn't make the reptile hobby look good and are not really kept for responsibly both for the safety of the animal and the humans keeping them. And so today, in what is going to be one of my most controversial videos, we're gonna talk about five different species of reptiles that I think shouldn't be as popular as they are, and I wanna see, not out of the hobby, just not nearly as popular as they are, and not being kept as well as they are, and five alternatives that I think would be better choices. And while yes, this is getting into more of Wick and Wicked's reptiles territory, I wanna be part of the conversation to talk about these different things in the community. And so without further ado, we're gonna get into those, and I do have my reasons for these, and I do give the alternatives, so before you crucify me down in the comments, please just you know hear me out for the video and hear kind of where I'm coming from. So let's get into it. The first one, which might be the only one that I will say I might be okay with wasn't in the hobby, and that's the red-eared slider. The red-eared slider is the thing that you think of when you think of turtle. That's the very first image. They've been popular for decades. They're the most popular, most trafficked species of turtle in the world, and not for the good reasons. They are popular for one reason only. They breed fast and they breed quick, and they breed a lot. Money, that's the reason why. And so because they have this turtle that pumps out eggs very quickly all of the time, and even the babies are very hardy, they just are very prolific in the hobby. And they're invasive everywhere. The, pond, the, the red eared slider only comes from a one small area of southeastern United States, and they're invasive in all 50 states, including Alaska and a bunch of other countries like Australia and Guam and Japan and China and even in the UK. It's not great. So, stepping away from me poo pooing on red eared sliders for too long, let's talk about the alternative. And I think that the musk turtles or the stink pot turtles are a good alternative. There are a couple different species out there, Easterns, Commons, Razorbacks. Razorbacks are probably the most popular because they cool, they have those cool little spikes on their carapace. Um, and I think they're a better pet reptile. They come from, most of them come from the same area as the red-eared sliders, so their care is very similar, but they are much smaller. The red-eared sliders sometimes can get close to, if not hit, two feet long in carapace length, which is a huge turtle. Most people think of keeping them in a 40. The musk turtles, as a whole, don't exceed seven inches. They average four and a half to six. And yeah, there are a few, probably a few outliers out there, but that's the average. So that means that the means and what most people have to keep a water turtle would actually be much more appropriate for these smaller species of the musk or stink pot turtle. So again, their care is very similar to the pond to the red-eared slider, but a much more smaller package, which will make them a better animal to keep in the hobby. And to be completely honest with you, I've doing research and being in the hobby for a while now, I've found that any turtle that has the word pond or slider in it, probably to avoid to be completely honest with you. Moving right along, we're gonna get into the next one that has also been in the hobby for a long time and way too popular for their own good, is the green iguana. Now we know that the green iguanas have been a huge subject, especially with the reptile community in the last couple years with everything going on in Florida and now moving to other states. Um, but they don't make good pet reptiles 90% of the time. In fact, I'm even yelling at mine half the time because you know they're a lizard that even females can get over four and a half, five feet long in length. They tail whip, sometimes they bite. They're territorial and offensive. Males can even be aggressive, especially when in breeding mode. They need a lot of height. 
They need a wide variety of diet. They need to eat a lot. They have high temperature needs, high basking spots, lots of humidity, big water dishes. It's a whole mess. And so I think that instead of a animal that is going to be not a great pet for a lot of people, a jeweled lucerta is a better alternative. Now I've talked about jeweled lucertas before. I did a whole video about European reptiles and they're a really cool species of lizard. That being said, the Lacerda group of lizards is a huge group of lizards and they are found from North Africa into Europe, the Mediterranean, parts of Central Asia, and a lot of lizards is called Lacerda. And even in my video, I misidentified and I gave a little bit of misinformation. And I did mention that it's in the comments of the video, but the, the pictures and the animal that I was talking about wasn't necessarily pertaining to the species of lizard or the info that I found because everything's called Lacerda. But this is the species of lizard that most of the time we were thinking of when we called a jeweled Lacerda. Really cool species of lizard. Much more manageable size. They really exceed three and a half, four feet in length. They're usually much smaller than that. Still larger than a bearded dragon most of the time. So to give you a better idea of how large they are, they're a little bit more attuned to different types of keeping. They can do better not having as many humidity issues as the green iguanas. They don't need as tall. They're not nearly as arboreal. They still like to climb and dig and bury and all the other fun stuff the lizards like to do, but they're not nearly as arboreal as the iguanas. They're also not nearly as territorial. They're not as defensive. They even have morphs. There's different localities and different variations and lines of them. There's even melanistic. So, you know, like a little small miniature black dragon, you know, like the, the melanistic black water monitors. I think they're water monitors, not Niles. Um, like a little smaller version ones of those. And they do end up kind of taming down and being able to be tong fed and handled a lot more readily than a large iguana, which even when not trying to, those claws can do some serious damage. The next one is the one that will probably get me the most guff, and that is the reticulated python. I did a video because someone asked me to talk about five good giant pet, rep, like giant snakes as reptiles, and honestly, I don't think the giant snakes really are good pets for most people. Even the people that have the ability to keep them properly aren't necessarily doing the best jobs. Like even my one retic, the cage I feel is a little small, so I do my best to exercise her and get her out as often as possible. But retics have kind of fallen into the camp of ball pythons to where because of morphs, there's an overabundance of them. But keeping a retic is not the same as keeping a ball python. They're smart, they're strong and powerful and to be respected animals and they cannot be kept the same way as even other larger species of snakes. And so I think that instead of animals that we know aren't being kept well, we go with an alternative if we do want one of those giants. And so I think that a boa, the boa imperators or the boa constrictors, or even a dwarf retic are better alternatives. But with the boas, as we know, they can get very large. Cupcake is well over 10, is at least 10 feet long. Still a very powerful, large animal that needs to be respected. And there are plenty of other ones that do often exceed six, seven feet in length very often. With the dwarf retics, there are some different island localities that sometimes they even average as small as, you know, six to nine feet. I will say though, and this is probably what's gonna get me yelled at, is that if you're thinking about one of these two, I would probably go with if one you know for sure is usually gonna stay at this size, go with the boas because there is a huge, long, extensive history of different lines and different subspecies that we know for a fact usually stay in the parameters of size, temperament, and needs as far as humidity, temps, and caging goes versus the dwarf retics. The dwarf retics have been starting to be bred into the mainland to get the morphs in a more manageable size, which is great. However, they don't always stay the same size. In the same clutch, there have been seen to be animals that hit seven, eight, nine feet, and ones that hit 12. 12 to 20 feet of the mainland retics, that's a big difference. Heck, even two, three, four feet, that's a big difference of that size of snake. However, they're still, I don't think they're quite to the point where they are consistently getting the same sizes yet. They are definitely working on it, and, and the people out there working with them are doing a good job of that. But I think for a more consistent, at least for the time being, and 
kind of more stable size, the Boas are probably the better choice. So that kind of took a bit of a downer and I'm gonna get real heavy here for a second for this next one and that is keeping hots. So venomous reptiles and we all know which ones we're talking. We're talking about the gaboons, the rattlesnakes, the king cobras, the mambas, all the different arboreal little vipers. 99.9% .9 of people, even who keep reptiles, should not keep hots. They are an animal that is a very unique, amazing, beautiful animal, and they're really cool. And to be able to work with hots, even to the point of like, you know, rattlesnake relocation is really cool, but they shouldn't be kept. It is such a huge responsibility that needs to be thought about that I see so many people don't. And how cavalier some people are with free handling them because they are smart, intelligent animals. They don't want to bite. It's it's expensive to make that venom. It's a last resort or for eating. They don't want to use it. And so you can free handle, you can handle safely plenty of venomous snakes, but it doesn't look good when there is a bite. So to avoid all of that, and again, I'm not saying that no one should keep venomous reptiles. I think that if you are in a place to where you can safely and responsibly do so, you should have the right to do it. However, most people don't, just like the giant reptiles, the giant snakes. That's why I only have one. I know for a fact that it is not responsible or ethical for me to do so. So the same thing with the hots. That is a life-changing event. That is a life-ending event. So an alternative to that, let's go with a different group of reptiles that won't give a medically significant bite under almost every circumstance. And that's the rear fang venomous colubrids. There is a wide range of rear fang colubrids. There's hognose, there's Asian vine snakes, there's flying snakes, there's Malayan leaf nose snakes, there's barren racers, false water cobras. So many different species of snakes that span the, you know, the, the, how much experience you need, the size, the temperament, the humidity requirements, the caging requirements, everything to fit your individual kind of want or interest that won't give a medically significant bite under almost every circumstance. There's, I'm not gonna say that there never are because there have been times where someone essentially has an allergic reaction to an, an essentially what is an envenomation of normally a fairly harmless reptile. That, but, you know, it's, it's very rare and it's something that I think is a little bit better for the reptile community as a whole and much more responsible for not only our communities, not only image, reputation, but for the individuals keeping them as well. And there is a huge variety. I mean, think about how many morphs hognose have and barons racers that already normally have two or three different color morphs as well, or I should say phases. And then even false water cobras, one of the larger ones, um, very intelligent, very cool. They even have several morphs now. So maybe we think a little bit more about those type of snakes versus the venomous ones that always put us on the news because we don't need more bad press. There is a huge target on the reptiles back right now. And we just beat the, you know, the Lacey Act amendments to this microchip bill that just got passed. But the reptile community, and if you guys wanna hear me really talk about this, just let me know in the comments and I will talk about this, but we are going to have our biggest fight in the next year and a half to two years. It is coming and it's gonna be bad. There will be laws passed. It's gonna be bad unless we figure our stuff out. But let's, let's, let's dial it back, let's dial it back. Let's finish this on a little bit of a lighter note. I know I got really heavy there for a second. This last species, and if you stuck this out and then you're not already yelling at me in the comments, um, there's probably a few different species that you think I may or may not touch on, but I think this is one that isn't talked about enough. And that is the Chinese water dragon or the Asian water dragon. And there are quite a few different subspecies and species out there from Australia to Papua New Guinea, parts of Indonesia, the Philippines and mainland Asia that as captives, they can be really cool display species, not really handleable for the most part. Um, but they can be really cool if kept properly. The problem is I've almost never seen it done outside of zoos and maybe two 
enclosures. I've never seen a good Asian Chinese water dragon set up. And a lot of that has to do with there's no good information readily or commercially available for keeping them. These guys were almost exclusively wild caught with the exception of like, you know, the Australian species that come in stressed, small, dehydrated, underweight, and baby lizards are very flighty and water dragons seem to keep that kind of throughout their lives uh, for the most part. And so what happens when you get a stressed, flighty little baby lizard that most people don't know how to properly care for, you get an animal that isn't kept properly and you see it with the water dragon specifically, and we all know what I'm talking about, is like the big scabs or scar tissue or split open busted lips, lower jaws and faces because they just smash into glass because they can't see glass very well and they get startled very easily and they just run to hide. And because most people don't even think about what all they need properly because it's not given to them, the information they need to keep these animals, they all ended up with these messed up faces. So I think a better alternative would be a mountain horn lizard or a mountain horn dragon. Now, these guys also come from a lot of the same areas in the, you know, Indo-Pacific islands, mainland Asia. But these guys are usually a little bit, you know, lighter bodied. They're still very arboreal, even more so than the water dragons. Um, a lot of the same requirements, plenty of humidity, plenty of climbing places, UV basking because they're both diurnal you know, varied insect diets, but these guys, they seem to do a little bit better. They're not as flighty. They seem to acclimate to human handling interactions a little bit better, and their enclosures and requirements aren't quite as large and intensive as the water dragons. So just to kind of wrap this all up, again, I don't think, and this is my opinion for sure, that I don't think that these guys should be removed from the hobby, that no one should be able to keep them, although I will say that the red sliders, eh. um, but just what they need and what we are able to give them doesn't align, or what we can give them, we don't most of the time. And so that's why I think that these alternatives, so instead of the green iguana, the jeweled lacerta, instead of the red slider, the musk turtles, and instead of Hots, venomous cobras, vipers, rear fang venomous, and instead of the Chinese water dragons, mountain horn lizards, those different alternatives would be much better choices, not only for you, but for the animals and for the reptile community as a whole. Now, again, I don't want to make it seem like I'm just bashing on keepers or on the reptiles themselves. I wanna be part of a conversation that we all need to be having about improving this hobby, not only for our benefit, for the animal's benefit, but for this community to be able to still exist. We need to be having these conversations. That's why I'm talking about rack systems. That's why I'm talking about these giant snakes. That's why I'm talking about these better alternatives for animals that aren't great. And while I'm not necessarily outright negative about some of the things and people in this hobby, we need to just kind of accept things that we need to stop doing heck even what youtubers are putting out there for the whole world to see sorry this was a little bit more of a downer video i do apologize but again i want to be part of this conversation for us to be better so if you stuck it out with me if you heard me out if you haven't murdered me yet thank you so much for sticking this out i have plenty more happy uplifting reptile comment coming up always with it a huge backlog there's a whole list of top five, I guess you could say I call it top five videos that I've done that aren't nearly this negative, that I talk more in depth about a bunch of really cool different species of uh, reptiles. If you wanna check that out right there. Thank you so much for you know just being part of this journey with me. Again, sorry to be a little bit more of a downer, but hope everyone's having a great day. Hope you enjoyed this video and we'll check you next time.